Hello, world. Welcome back to Golf Subpar. Colt Nost and my man, Drew Stoltz. Little bit under the weather right now, but he's going to battle through it because we got a lot to get to. Unless you've been living under a rock, you know, a lot's been going on in the golf world. But before we get to that, just want to remind you to go check out our YouTube page, like, subscribe, all of that. You can see our incredible caddy video there where we were basically the best caddies on the planet. Show Joe Griner, Joe Scovern, how they could improve at their job. And look what happened, Sleaze. Joe Scovern. Now on the bag for Ludwig Obert ever since the video came out. It didn't take long. Did it, buddy. Uh, I got to say, I can't speak for you, but I got to expect the same. Uh, I assume your phone's been blowing up by guys all across the world after seeing that video. Wanting to get a little piece of the action. Can't blame them. Can't blame them. But we love what we do. I said it's going to take a serious digit. But how about that for Joey Scov? I mean, is there is there a better bag in the world starting right now for the next, I don't know, 15, 20 years than Ludwig Obert? So I've been hearing rumblings about this for, for a little bit that that was a possibility. Um, talked to Joe a little bit about it and was like, dude, this guy, in my opinion, can be number one in the world very quickly. Like he's got all the tools. Tom Kim is fantastic. He is a great player. He's won three times on the PGA Tour. Very solid. But in my opinion, Ludwig is on another planet. Like that's I, he's got all the juice. I expect him to win a major championship this year. He he's the real deal, man. It's hard. You can't turn that job down. No, that's it's a it's a generational bag, dude. I'm we're talking a uh, Rory when he came out. You know, a John Rahm, who I'm sure we'll get to in a minute when he came out. Like, there's not many of these guys like a Ludwig Obert. What he's done in this short amount of time is since he turned pro, it's ridiculous. And like, I'm being dead serious when I say starting right now, start from a clean slate. The next 15, 20 years, what's a better bag to have? I don't think there is one. Wow, that's. That's a bold statement, but it's hard to disagree. Yeah. I mean, he he drives the shit out of it. His iron game continues to get better. His short game is fantastic, and he putts well. Oh, and by the way, he's a rather good-looking dude, too, so he's pretty marketable. So, Joe, maybe you can uh, you know, take some of the scraps, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, there's going to be a few <laughs> left over. I mean, other than that, the job is shit. But, you know, those things you mentioned, uh, pretty damn good. I'm dead serious. Like, uh, you know, we heard rumblings about this for a while, and I was like, I mean, I'm being dead honest when I say I don't starting right now. There'll be young guys that come out. That'll be awesome, too. But this is a this is one you can't say no to. Yeah. Well, speaking of things you can't say no to John yeah. Rom signs with live golf. You know, it, it still as as well as we know him, as great as he's been to us on this show, our Sirius XM show, Gravy in the Sleeves. Like we talk to him all the time. We see him out at Whisper Rock and Silverleaf. It still is a little bit of a shocker. I mean, you, you, you heard the rumors that it was possibly coming, but when it finally became official, and John Rahm announced it. It was a little bit of a shock, but when you get offered three hundred, somewhere between $300 and $600 million, and you're going to own your team, um, I, I just don't see how you can say no to that, especially with everything that's going on with the PGA Tour right now. Exactly, and Colt, like, uh, I'm sure, you know, when this was announced, like me, you got a bunch of messages saying, like, can you believe it? Your boy's going to live. You know, oh, my God, I can't believe it. Can you believe your boy? I'm like, my response was, yeah, dude. <laughs> Yeah, I can believe it. That is a shitload of money. And I know he's got a ton already, but who am I or who is anyone else to tell someone else how much money they should earn or where they should do their job? I mean, he made a decision that he felt was best. I'm happy for him. I'm very happy for him. Send him a congratulation text, just like I did to Joe Scoffer when he made it official with Ludwig. And um, I I'm happy for all my friends that make a bunch of money at their job. But I've seen some like hate online cult, which of course is going to come. But what people are like, mad or feel betrayed that he left and i think that anger is so misdirected because i think the anger shouldn't be on the individual making the decision that they think is best for them if you're gonna be angry at anyone i think it should be directed at the powers that be in the professional world of golf that let it get to this point like i'm not going to hold an individual to a higher standard than i hold the people controlling the entire professional game of golf right now uh when they've made the exact same decision that John just made. They're at the table asking for the money from the exact same people that John just took it from. So I'm happy for John. It, it's a huge blow to the PJ Tour, a huge coup for for Live Golf. But I think until they come to an agreement, Colt, like this type of stuff, just he ain't going to be the last one, man. No, he's not, obviously. And that's going to be one of the questions is, who's next? And Tony Finau has been one of those guys that we've been hearing about. Well, right before we stepped into here, he came out and said he's not going. He's looking forward to Maui. Um, he's looking forward to his whatever year it is on the PGA Tour, and at the bottom, hashtag, I'm not leaving. So I don't know if that's a negotiation deal or a, a tactic or what's going on, because everything I've heard is Tony is going. But now he came out, and listen, the man himself said it, so I'm going to believe Tony Finau, and that makes me happy that he's not going. But like you said, 300 to $600 million, 
you can't you can't say no to that. And people bring up what he said 17, 18 months ago, where he said, I, I want to leave my mark on professional golf. I'm all about history and legacy. 400 million won't change the way I live my life. Well, at that time, I believe 400 million probably wasn't on the table. It wasn't actually there, but now it is. That That is on there. Like, Here's a piece of paper. This is what you make if you come to live golf. And it's like, oh my God, that's a ridiculous amount of money. And as J.J. Watt said, if the numbers were true, he would drive over to John's house and physically make him sign it because that kind of money just doesn't come around. By the way, in my opinion, we, we heard just what Shohei Otani got. He got $700 million from the Los Angeles Dodgers, but I, I just don't get that number in my opinion, with with where golf is. Golf's not the NFL. Golf's not Major League Baseball. With where golf is, that number just shocks me. Yeah, and it's just, I mean, it's not a real market, I guess, value there, but you're dealing with an entity that wants a seat at the table. They got more money than God. They have in, like legitimately endless amounts of money. If they want something, they're going to get it. And I think that's why the PGA Tour this whole time is probably underestimated. It's like money ends up winning out, Colt, eventually, in almost everything. But... If I'm a glass half full guy, which I like to think that I am, I think that Rom and potentially the, the names that are going to come down the road as we expect more to follow, it could be the tipping point, dude. And it's like, okay, look, golf isn't big enough from a viewer standpoint on a global perspective to chop it in half and say, here's half of the greatest players. They're over here. Here's half of the other greatest players. They're over here. And they only come together four times a year. It's just not that big, like relatively speaking. And that sucks. So, and it sucks for that's the one thing too that's getting left out is like the only people losing in this deal are us, the fans, the guys that support the game of golf that want to watch the best players in the world week in, week out. We're the only ones losing because whether you go to live and take that pile of money, you win. If you stay on the PGA Tour, they've been juicing their purses and doing everything they can to shovel money to guys. They're winning too. Who's losing? Like basically just the fans. And they're, they're going to mess around and lose interest from a lot of the casual fans because they're just like, dude, I can't keep up with all this. But with the ROM announcement and the pot potential future ones coming, I think this may be the tipping point to where they just got to come to the table and be like, look, dude, enough's enough. How do we figure this out? How do we coexist? And if that does happen, John will look like the smartest guy in the world because he's going to get to have his cake and eat it too. I mean, they've got the PGA Tour backed into a corner right now because they can just keep picking off guys. And I mean, mm -hmm. I, it's ridiculous to offer guys 100, 200, 300 million dollars in my opinion, but they can do it. Because they want a seat at that table. They want this thing to come together. And the PGA Tour, listen, they, like you said, they're juicing their purses. They're paying out all this pip money and everything. But as they say in the great movie Top Gun, your ego's writing checks your body can't cash. Because oh, they are work. absolutely, they can't keep this pace up. They, I mean, you already see it. They're asking sponsors yeah. to, to put in these, like, these fees to get the tournaments to stay there and everything. Wells Fargo, one of the loyal events on the PGA Tour out there at Quail Hollow, they said they're out after this year. They don't want any part of this. So I think they've. I think this is going to give us a chance for this deal to get done before the deadline of December 31st. I think it almost has to. You look, you look at, like you mentioned, Wells Fargo, uh, Honda. It's happened to these guys. They're asking these sponsors to foot the bill to try to keep up with these purses, and they're not willing to do it. They're like, no, dude, why? I'm paying more now. You want me to pay more? to get a field that's more diluted than it's ever been before. I'm not getting the biggest name guys. Half of them are over there, but you, yet you want me to take on this financial burden to maintain it. Like it doesn't pencil for them. They're, they're in the return on investment business. Like they're not going to do that. The PJ tour was slow to react. They got out over their skis. They could maintain it for a year like they did this year, but they can't do it going down the road. And ultimately now they're in a bind and they need money. Like both sides have something the other one wants. The PJ tour needs a bunch of money. Piff has it. And Piff wants a seat at the table and like golf legitimacy. And guess what? The PJ Tour has it. Like, figure it out. It's where this is whether you're pro live, anti live, pro PGA, anti PGA, whatever. This is where we are right now. And something's got to come together, or just basically all the fans are getting screwed out of seeing the best players play other than four times a year, which the majors will be juicy this year. If it doesn't happen this year, like they, they, they get added clout. But other than that, everything else is just diluted. Yeah, the majors are going to be incredible. I just, you know, I think the fan, the fans are getting screwed. And I think they're also getting sick of hearing about all this. Yes. Oh, poor rich people arguing over where they're going to play. Like, no one cares. We just want to see you go out there and compete and play against each other on the best golf courses in the world for the biggest prizes. I mean, that's what we want to see. But one question I have is, Jay Monahan, where are you? Like, that's a recurring question. Can, can dude. we just see that's your a recurring face? Question. Make sure you're still there. Give us something. At least come out and be like, look, we know everything that's going on. 
We're working on it. This is, I would that would I would actually be okay if he would just come out and say, "Listen, we're working diligently on getting this thing done." I haven't seen his face. I, I know he did some speaking engagement the other day at some I don't know even know what it was. But other like he has not come out and spoke to golf fans. I feel like since June sixth. Yeah, and but, you're. You're getting it. This is what I've been saying the whole time, man. It's like, dude, this is why you have the big job. This is why you get paid the big dollars is to handle these tough situations. This is the biggest one golf's ever been confronted with. Where are you? And for a long time, he trotted Rory out there and he did his work for him. Then the June 6th announcements came, which was a surprise to every single person out there. And what happened? I'm not going to say anything about his health, but he had a leave of absence. He wasn't there to answer questions. Other people were. Other people were at the congressional hearings. It's like, dude, what exactly is it that (laughs) why are you, you know, why are you the guy? The leaders have to lead, and this is the time for leadership, and it hasn't been there, and I'm totally with you. Come out and make some sort of statement. Be visible. Answer the tough questions. That's why you're in place, and I just think as this thing moves on and on, uh, it, it's getting harder and harder for the J defenders to defend him just because it, it's a tough look, and I, I, I can't imagine it have really have gone much worse for him since this whole thing started. Yeah, I think you know the next few weeks are going to be very interesting to see if a deal gets done, see who else goes and signs with Liv, but, um, you know, still a lot of unanswered questions. It's crazy. John Rahm's really, 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 really wealthy, which uh-huh. is cool. Um, I, you know, we're going to miss him on the PGA Tour, but congrats to him on making all that money. And also congrats to Lydia Cohen, and Jason Day, who won the Grant Thornton, the mixed team event, by the way, which kind of got overshadowed by the John Rahm news, but that was a really cool event down in Naples, and congrats to them on the win. Remember when the golf rollback was, like, a big deal? That was, like, four days ago? That feels like ages ago it's just you can't keep up with all the things that keep going on in this world right now it's like all that stuff was put to bed john rom dominating the headlines as he should but it's it's a wild time do you think colt though with john rom that this like increases the chances of a deal coming together sooner rather than later do you feel more i do more ambitious that it'll happen yeah i do because the number was just so ridiculous like i mean we, we hear you know phil mixon got 200 early on dustin johnson Brooks Kepka, Bryson Shamba, 125 to 150. Like, those are massive numbers, but 300 million. I mean, that's a total another league. And I know he's the number three ranked player in the world, but that's that's just wild. I think that's just a statement saying, all right, here's the deal. You know, everyone has a number and we can get to it. We can get to every single person's number on the PGA Tour, maybe except for Roy McIlroy, just because he has such a firm stance against it. But everyone else, we can get to their number and we'll get them if you don't want to do this deal with us. Yeah, what we, what we want, we're going to get. Let me ask you this, because when the framework agreement was initially announced, there was a no tampering clause in there where you, they couldn't recruit, you know, mm-hmm. Liv couldn't recruit from the PJ Tour, but that was taken out by the DOJ, okay? Like, no, you can't do that. We're going to sit down. Well, the lawsuit was dropped. Right, yeah, so that was, the lawsuit was dropped, but the no tampering clause had to be taken out. Like, you can't go actively recruit. When the PJ Tour started to announce, like, hey, we have other options, we have private equity options that we're exploring and things like that, do you think that... I don't want to say pissed live off, but to the point where they're like, oh, you're exploring other finance options to where you don't have to, you know, come to the table with us. And then, all right, we're going to go after your players. Do you think someone asked me that the other day? And I was like, that's a valid point. I don't know if that uh, had anything to do with the John Rom deal or not. I don't think it made the people over at Live and Piff happy by any means. It's like, hey, here's the deal. And by the way, that report came out that Live or Piff offered to put $1 billion toward, in yeah. a fund towards the players that stayed loyal and then $2 billion towards the PGA Tour. Uh, where's that piece of paper? Sign it right now because that sounds like a pretty damn good deal. Dude, a billion for the guys that didn't go. We're talking guys that Liv's never wanted, never would talk to, had zero interest in whatsoever, and they're going to get some sort of chop out of a billion. I mean, if that was an actual real offer, uh, I don't know who said, nah, that's not good enough. Well, let's go back to the table. I yeah. mean, it's it's like everything they could have ever wanted plus, in my opinion, but it somehow wasn't good enough. I think a deal gets done after this John Rom news and potentially more names to follow. Well, I sure hope so. But good news is, Slees, I made it back from Cabo in one piece. I didn't have to deal with all that golf ball rollback stuff, which was very nice. You were still I, hitting bombs. Doesn't matter. You could play a marshmallow with still his seeds, dog. Hitting bombs, sipping on my favorite tequila, Sincoro, right here. I think I still got some of my blood from last week, but mm. Wouldn't be surprised. Very delicious, as always. And you know, when it comes to holiday parties and gifting, we all want to impress, right? Well, subpar listeners, enter Sincoro Tequila, the liquid definition of greatness, crafted by five NBA owners who know a thing or two about winning. This tequila is like the MVP of your home bar. Sincoro Tequila is ultra smooth, rich, and delicious, and has a long, luxurious finish. 
Plus, it's packaged in this gorgeous bottle that'll wow even the pickiest folks out there. Speaking of being wowed, Slays, you don't know this because you're not here. We got a little Talk special me, Christmas gift from our friends at Sincoro. This beautiful engraved bo bottle right here. My name is in the back of that bottle right there. You've got one here waiting on you if Mark and I don't drink it before. Okay, or, hands or, off, kids. Hands or, we'll, off. or we'll sell to the highest bidder. Not sure yet. But That's these fair. things are incredible. It says Drew. They even spelled it right. Oh, God bless them. So if you're looking for the ultimate gift for the golfer who seemingly has it all, we've got you covered. Sincoro is offering our subpar listeners the opportunity to personalize a bottle when you order at Sincoro.com or ReserveBar.com. Just use the code Sincoro Engrave. That's C I N C O R O E N G R A V E. Sincoro Engrave when you place your order, and it'll be like giving the gift of a hole in one, only with a personal and luxurious touch. Sincoro is all about celebrating greatness, and what better way to celebrate the holidays than with a tequila that embodies that spirit? Whether you're raising a glass to the holidays, toasting to the new year, or gifting a trophy of greatness, make it Sincoro Tequila. Cheers to excellence. And cheers to you, Sleeves, by the way. I don't have an orange today because I sent it over so you can get your vitamin C and get to feeling better. Hey, appreciate you, my man. I'll cheers you one right here. I've been a bit on the IR, but I now know exactly what every single family member and friend of mine will be getting for Christmas. There's no That's one that nobody doesn't like when they get that. Yeah. You know, what else, I, you know what else I like doing is getting amongst it with some music on the golf course. And our friends yep. at Rockform are back. This speaker, unbelievable, 24-hour battery life, waterproof. Obviously, see so if you happen to spill a little Sincoro, no problem at all. The magnet ain't going anywhere. As we always like to joke, it could pry open Ches Reeves' wallet. That's strong. Very, very strong. Keeps Quite your cup strong. holder free. Built-in speakerphone. Two speakers can be paired at once if you really want to get amongst it. Go to rockform.com. That's R-O-K-F-O-R-M.com. Enter code subpar, and we're going to get 25% off this holiday season. That's another banger. True story. I was playing pickleball last week. Had the uh, rock form out, playing a little tunes. One of my idiot friends came over in between games, knocked it off the table, fell on the ground, which was concrete. You know what happened, Colt? Hurt the concrete. Exactly. Nothing. Kept playing. Party kept going on. Get you. This is another good holiday gift right here. These things are spectacular. Use it once. You'll never use a different one. Tequila and music. Nothing better. And some golf, by the way, which our guest this week, he happens to like all three of those things very much. Not tequila as much anymore. But back in his day, he wasn't scared to put some back. But this is one, man, I've been wanting to get this guy on for a long time, Sleaze. He's one of the best personalities the game of golf has ever seen. I've had the opportunity to spend some time with him in Dallas. The great Lee Trevino sits down with us for an over an hour. The Super Max, dude. There's nobody better. One of a kind. They don't make him like this anymore. Always fun to hear Mr. Trevino talk a little golf. And he's got his new Super Max golf line out. Make sure you go check that out. Let's get to Lee Trevino on Golf Subpar. Okay, folks, we have a national treasure with us here today. One of the greatest to ever hold a golf club. 92 professional wins, six-time major champ, and a man who has one of the greatest quotes of all time, in my opinion. I can't wait to wake up in the morning and hear what I have to say. The great Lee Trevino. Mr. Trevino, how are you? How are you, guys? Man, it's, it's great. I mean, I tell you what, you guys do a great job. And uh, I really appreciate being on today. I just turned 84 years old, um, still swinging a little bit. I got to tell you a little story, though. <laughs> yes. I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready for the father-son. And I hadn't played all year, hardly at all. I don't play much anymore. And I figured I've got to get ready. I was hitting it so bad, I actually topped some balls on the driving range. I mean, I never topped the ball. I, don't, I can't remember ever in my life doing this. So my son says to me, she says, you need to go see Randy. Randy Smith is a personal friend of mine. You know Randy. Oh, yeah. And, 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 and Daniel says, you, he needs to look at you. He needs to look at you. I said, Daniel, I made a vow many, many years ago that I would never take a lesson from a golf, from anyone that I could beat. I said, if I could beat him, I wouldn't take a lesson from him. So I called Randy up and I said, have you got 15 minutes to look at me? I said, I think you can beat me now. <laughs> that is beautiful. You're allowed to teach me now, Randy. The great Randy, Randy Smith. Randy, and you know what? He, he absolutely hit it on the head right on the thing. He says, you're trying to get more speed. And by getting more speed, you're a holder. He said, you were a holder your whole life. 
And he says, you're trying to get more speed holding. And he says, you're actually moving past the line. Your center line is moving way to the left and, and you have no speed at all. And, and he was exactly right. There's a big tree on the left. And he says, I want you to hit the seven iron over that tree. And, you know, I stayed back, you know, where my head almost moved backwards. The ball went over the tree. He said, that's all you got to do. He said, just pretend there's a tree in front of you. You, you're a good teacher and you still got it like you said you're heading down to the pnc you've played 26 or 27 of these in a row how much fun is this week for you i know I'll you're playing with PNC, daniel this year pnc does one fabulous job this particular golf tournament is our augusta it's like people trying to go to augusta i qualified for augusta i qualified for augusta this is daniel and i two years ago had the lead with four holes to go and uh, Dustin Thomas and, and his dad birdied a couple of holes coming in. And we, we actually finished third because VJ got in in the second plane. But as soon as we get on the plane and go back, we, we start reminiscing about where we made the mistakes and what we got to work on for next year. We actually start thinking about the father son. It's like it, it's like Great Britain in, in the Ryder Cup. As soon as they win the Ryder Cup, they start thinking about how they're going to win next year uh, all, all of a sudden. But, yeah, we start – we start thinking about it um, all year. We talk about it all year. Yeah, we, we, I, I look forward to this. You know, I had the pleasure of, of playing at a, at a high level and winning major championships, and I can't tell you how that feels coming down the stretch. But uh, playing in, in a father-son is, is, is fabulous. To watch your son, you know, hitting shots and trying and working hard at it and carrying me. I mean, he won putt at every green two years ago. I, could, I had the yips, you know. I had the gifts. I still, I don't know where I'm going now. I'm going long putter, <laughs> arm lock, short putter. I'm going back. I'm, the right foot's going. I've got so many things going on instead of just putting like I used to, you know, just getting up there and doing my old stuff. I don't know. Well, I've, I've known you for a long time and I know there's no doubt you will figure it out when you get down there. But this, this event's been so special. But now that Tiger Woods has started playing with his son, Charlie, what's it been like seeing Tiger? Because we know him as the ferocious competitor out there winning major championships, but now you can truly see how much he enjoys it being out there with his son, Charlie. He, he, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I, the first thing I said to him when I saw him, he was there and I saw him coming to the range and he was hitting some chips and I was in a cart and he, and I know Tiger pretty well. I've known him since he was eight years old and I walked over to him and and I he, before he ever said a word, he had a smile on his face. And Charlie was hitting chip shots. And 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 as the first thing I said to him, as I said, now you know how your dad felt. Mm. And he says he looked at me and he says, you know, he says you're right. I said, yeah. I said you're very proud of this guy, of this guy, aren't you? And he said, I sure am. And I, I said, uh, I, it, it, there's no experience like it. And, and when Charlie hit that driver three wood on the green on the third hole and, and had a putt for an eagle, I mean, this kid, this kid, I mean, he went to my belt buckle and he's hitting, he's hitting high three woods with a draw. I can't do that off of a tee, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was amazing. It was just amazing to watch this kid hit golf balls. But Tiger... It, it, it's, it's got a, 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 a competitive streak in him, as you well know. It doesn't make any difference if he's playing marbles or throwing darts. He wants to win. He wants to win. And um, there'll be a threat this year because Charlie's hitting it farther and um, and he's playing better. Now, And if, if you noticed his scores in, in his high school tournament, which they won, Benjamin won the state championship, uh, he didn't play well the first two rounds, but he shot 67, I think, the last round. And they used the, his round, and they ended up winning state. But um, I'm pretty sure Charlie's practicing pretty hard right now. Yeah. He's got some game, no doubt. I have to assume. And just watching him on television is strange as a guy that grew up, that kind of got into the game because of Tiger Woods. You see this kid in every single mannerism, the way he leans on the putter, the twirls, the fist pumps and stuff. I mean, it's weird watching it. You're like, oh, my God, that's just a little mini version. What about the ankle last year? What oh, about yeah, when, the when, limping? <laughs> yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, <laughs> limping. And he's and, and 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 he's limping also. He said, "I hurt my ankle," and they're going down the fairway. 
That's crazy. And there's like two people with three legs. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they were just beat up. They were beat up. I want to ask they you one last up. thing. I want to ask you one last thing about Tiger because I didn't realize you met him when he was eight years old. So yeah. give me you know, the I, first impressions of an eight-year-old Tiger Woods. Did you know I'll something you, like I'll tell you this, this could had, happen? He had glasses on. He had a pair of glasses on, clear glasses. They were huge. They were bigger than his face. And he, we, we sponsored. I was with the Toyota company uh, for quite a few years, almost eight years on 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 uh, uh, before I went on the senior tour. And he won all the tournaments, and he played in in uh, Southern California. He in that you know junior program down there, and Toyota sponsored it. And at the end of every year, they would have one last tournament for the juniors. And, and uh, it's a junior organization there in San Diego, one of the best in the country. And we would go down to present the trophies. And they gave trophies for low round of the year, most low rounds of the year, most tournaments won, player of the year. Uh, I, and and uh, we had to give Tigers uh, a truck to take all his trophies home. <laughs> because he won them all. He won everything, most improved. And so when he was like 11 or 12 years old, we were there and all the kids were agging me on about having a driving contest with him. And I said, what do you mean driving contest? He wasn't real tall at the time. He had those big old glasses on and he says, yeah. He said, Let's, you want to have driving? So, so he hit one and he, I mean, he busted it. And I hit one and I looked at it and I said, I tell you what, Make a deal with you. What? I said, it's the tie. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I said it's the tie because uh, he outdrove me. Uh, I, I think he was 12 years old. Yeah, I've known him a long time. Long time. Yeah, That's I, awesome. I kept up with him. Uh, I, I, I remember when I, I remember the press conference uh, in 1996 when he was sitting there. And what's the first thing he said? He had a little smile and he says, Hello, world. I mm -hmm. mean, that's remember that's exactly that's what he it. said. Yeah, that's, yeah. Those are the famous lines, and I want to. We want to get into a lot of Lee Trevino stories, but one last Tiger one for me. As he's gotten older, you can kind of notice he's more available to the younger players, like Justin Thomas, for instance. Right? He he kind of took him under his wing. He helps him out. In your current, like right now, do you have any tour pros that come to you and want to pick your brain and say, "Hey, Lee, when I'm out here, I think this," or do you have any advice for this type of shot? Are you offering advice to some of the young pros oh, that yeah, are out you there? Oh, yeah, you know, I, I I do that all the time. The only person, the only pro that ever came here uh, to Dallas when I was here, and he was visiting a friend of his, and he called me, and we went out to Preston Trails, and we we did it was uh, Kucher. Mm. Uh, Kucher came, and we worked on the short game a little bit, you know. Uh, that uh, that was it. It's pretty easy to chip at, at PT because we have Zoysia. And uh, mm -hmm. I mean, that's like teeing your ball up with a peg, you know, every time you play on Zoysia, especially if it's if it's got any growth to it whatsoever. But, um, oh, yeah, yeah. And as a matter of fact, uh, what was it, last year or, or so when Charlie and I and, and Tiger were at the end of the driving range, uh, you know, he uh, Tiger was having to hit some short wet shots and stuff so Charlie could, could see – what my hands were doing and what I, how I was coming across with the ball and then hitting the fade, you know, how I was doing it. Um, I hit a fade by uh, actually putting my hands way forward and, and getting the, getting my hands close to the body and rotating. And I, I, I don't want to hit a push fade. I want to hit a fade, a true fade. Tiger hits a fade a different way. He opens the club a little bit. Watson does that also. Uh, they open, they maneuver the club a little bit open, and then they come across it and, and the ball fake. I don't like to do that because holders, if you don't, if, if, if you're a holder, you have to watch that because you'll shove it. You'll push a, a, a fake to the right. So I have to be square to target or, or I mean, square to, to my line uh, and with my hands way forward because I don't want them to push forward anymore. And, and I come across it. But you know that that's about it it's a different game as you well know uh, i mean it's a power game now you know nobody does anything scotty scotty is <clears throat> it, it, it doesn't surprise me that he is dominated and he always played like he's played and the reason for it is because he's big he's tall he plays closer to the ball the closer you can play to the ball the more the golf swing comes pendulum, okay? 
less things can go wrong. The shorter you are, and the, the, the farther away you have to stand from the ball, and it's an arc now, a lot of things can go wrong. People criticize, uh, uh, people, people criticize uh, uh, Sheffer because of the way he slides his right foot back. And I tell people, I said, man, I said, that's, that's, that's genius. And they said, why? I said, because he, gets, he connects the ball at 7 o'clock. And I said, you want a club to come in the, from the inside. You never want a club coming in from the outside, over the top. You want it to come in from the inside. That's how you work it. And I said, when he slides that foot back, his hands actually come inside closer to his body. And that's where his power is. And what is he, 6'3", six, 6'4", six, something like that. And the, the, he had a little, you know, in the middle of the summer, he had a little problem. Randy and I talked about it. He had a little problem with the putter, and uh, he had it out of position. Uh, you know, he's a hitter; he hits it. And when you when you when you don't stroke a putt, and you take a putter back and 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 you hit it, you can't have the ball too far forward. That's where you make the mistake. Bad putters, uh, when you start having putting problems, generally it's because. The, 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 the ball's too far forward in your stand. Let me tell you something. You're a tree with two limbs. They, your limbs can only go that far, that way. In other words, you're, the trunk's not moving. So in putting, if, if the arms can only go so far out, and if the ball's way up there, it's going to start rotating. The putter will start rotating to the left. Then you'll try to compensate. Then you'll push to the right. If you noticed, he pushed a lot of putts, pulled a lot of putts, and then he got it straightened out. I watched him in the Bahamas. He put it fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah if he puts like that, it's trouble for the rest problems. of the field. But you know, yeah, you mentioned it, working it's, with it's, it's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Some big news here from Subpar. We have officially launched our own YouTube page. Make sure to subscribe at golf underscore subpar on YouTube. Check out this week's video. Uh, like, subscribe, do all the stuff. Colt, we got some cool behind the scenes stuff coming and uh, give you a little outside look at some of the stuff outside the studio. So, Please like, please subscribe. You're the best listeners in the game. We love you. Back to the show. You mentioned working with some guys like, I mean, one of my favorite days of the year was every year you and I would go out to Dallas National and spend the day, practice, have lunch, play nine holes. Like it was just, it, it fascinates me the way you talk about golf because you truly love it so much. But one thing I always noticed when we would go play was downwind, like you didn't really hit it that far, but into the wind, you struck it so well. Yeah. You would hit it up there with pretty much anyone you would play with. What yeah. what was it about that? Because you you told me a funny comment. I, I believe something like, if every hole was into the wind, Nicholas would have been something. Like you you basically would have had his number. <laughs> He'd have been a pharmacist. I said. <laughs> there it is. That's what. That's the line. <laughs> not really. Not really. I was making a joke. He's the goat. He's the yeah. goat. You can say whatever you want to about whomever. He's the goat. I didn't know Bobby Jones. I know he was a goat too. And 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 uh, and and. Uh, Walter Hagen was tough as nails, but I got to see and play against the GOAT. And uh, I'm sure Tiger was just as tough or tougher than the GOAT. But I go by majors and I go by whatever, you know. I mean, Tiger's won more tournaments than Jack did. Um, but, you know, Tiger's got 18 majors. Uh, uh, I mean, Tiger's got, what, 15 majors and, 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 mm -hmm. uh, and the GOAT has 18. So that's what I go by, yeah. I love be a it. pharmacist. He'd be a pharmacist. You, well, stay on Nicholas then for a second, because when it came to being paired with Nicholas, like head to head, you were as successful as virtually anyone during that time. Was that just because playing with Nicholas got the like go back to the seventy one, you know, U.S. Open, you got the eighteen hole playoff and all that? Did he just bring the best out of you, and you, or was there something oh, yeah. about your game yeah. that you think kind of threw him off a little bit? Yeah, Nicholas. Nicholas brought the the best out in everybody. Uh, he set the bar. Uh, he set the bar. See the the the. The, the mentality that I have is I, I, I didn't think I could be him. But if I was in the same group, was a feather in my, in my hat. Because that was just like the playoff in 71. When we were sitting in that locker room and we were asked the question about how we were going to fare tomorrow, and my statement was, I've already won. Whether I lose or not, I have won. And I said, because I shot 280, tied the best player in the world. And I said, even if I lose tomorrow, I have won. I said, because I got to play. 
an extra 18 holes against the best in the world. That tells you something. And 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 you got to take a little bit of pride in that. But I I enjoyed playing with him uh, simply because he hit it so well. And and the thing that I learned from Jack more than anything is he made a plan. Mr. Hogan was like that. He made a plan. In other words, when he got to a golf course, especially a major golf course, he would map that course out. And he would decide what club he was going to hit off that tee every day. And that's what he would do. Case in point, we played Tanglewood, come to 18. He's the shot back. He didn't hit driver. He hit a three wood. And I couldn't believe he was hitting three wood off of 18 at Tanglewood. And he's a shot back. Last round, Hubert Green and I and Jack Nicholas were playing together. But you know why he hit the three wood? Because that's that's exactly what he had planned. And, and that's what he did. He was a master. I mean, he, he could look at a scoreboard and play. When he played a round of golf, he'd look at a scoreboard. And he didn't care if he shot 71 and somebody came in there with a 65. And he would say, ah, they'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> Except for they you. Were, yeah, they would Except come for back. you. Yeah. He knew you wouldn't be back. Well, he knew that I wasn't going to give him anything. You know, he said that before. He said where he was difficult is that if he got in front, I had to do something to overtake that because he wouldn't give you anything back. Uh, you know, I mean, when I won the Open <clears throat> in 68 uh, up in New York, and and um, uh, in Rochester, New York, and he was playing in front of me. I, I think he was yes, because I was playing with Bert Yancey, and he was playing in front of me. And we came. I I hadn't hardly missed a fairway the whole week, and I'd never won a tournament before. That was my first win. Mm -hmm. was, was the '68 Open in at Rochester, and Oak Hill, and. I get to 16, I put it in the rough. Man, I wasn't used to going in the rough. <laughs> and, I, I, and then I chipped it. I, I hit it back out about 40 yards short of the green. I chipped it up about six feet. I made it par. 17, dog leg right. Very difficult hole for me. I hit driver. I couldn't reach it. I hit driver three wood short of the bunker. I chipped it six inches. I duck hooked it off 18 in the rough. Kevin Quinn, my caddy, said to me, he said, take the wedge, just put it out in front. you got a four-shot lead. I said, man, I'm not going to be remembered as winning the 68 Open laying up on 18. Give me that six iron. I laid the side right over that one, too. He <laughs> stayed in the rough. <laughs> uh, he, said, uh, he said, are you ready to hit the wedge now? I said, give me that wedge. And I hit the wedge, and I hit it three feet from the hole and, and hold it. But I, I was choking – I mean, that was the first time that I felt a lot of pressure. And uh, I, I was choking so bad that I had enough cotton in my mouth that I could have knitted a sweater. I'm telling you, it was unbelievable. I love bad that line. Yeah, and I ended up winning. And you know who played behind us that year? Uh, it was so funny because television was just starting to get into the, to the golf business. And ABC at the time was telecasting that. And they, the, the audience and the television wanted to see Arnold Palmer. And Arnie was way back in the field. And they came to us and, and, and asked us if, if Arnold, and, Arnold and, a, and an amateur by the name of Jack Lewis could play behind us simply because the, the, the people wanted to see Arnie. And we told him, fine, no problem. And that's it. And that was the first time I met Arnold is when he, is, uh, he came and, and – uh, congratulated me in the um in the scores uh, in the scores team yeah that was the first time i ever met him he had just finished right behind us yeah that's awesome that's really cool that they did that for for tv and everything but with you know you're you're one of the best shot makers of all time and today the game has changed so much where they don't play the way you do anymore what are your thoughts about the direction the game of golf has gone compared to what it was back in your day well you know i have mixed emotions about what they're trying to do to it right now is is they're a little upset about they're thinking that the golf courses are not long enough only because these guys have, have, have trained they're bigger they don't have any fat on them like me you know i mean i'm, I'm i mean and they're bigger guys they're taller uh they hit it so far um that 
and, and the golf clubs, the way that the golf clubs are manufactured and uh, they're, 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 they're made stronger. I mean, all these clubs that they're hitting now, people are saying, oh, you know, you're standing at home and the guy's got 167 yards. What's he hitting? Oh, he's got a wedge out. And you're saying, what? A wedge? <laughs> I'd like to hit a five hybrid. Uh, you know, you, you, we're hitting six irons, 167, 165. But the problem is the manufacturers have been able to manufacture golf clubs to where they have less loft, but the way that the cavity back is constructed and the clubs are hollow, they have a little bit of a trampoline effect now, and the ball gets high and it goes farther. And everybody's starting to panic about, oh, we got to make the courses longer, make the courses longer. You have to understand one thing about golf courses is those pros don't pay dues. They're not paying dues. They just come there for four days, take your money, and leave. And the members now have to put up with this golf course. They're the ones that are paying the initiation fee. They're the ones that are paying the dues. And now they're talking about bringing the ball back. And I'm just wondering now, are they going to do this with tennis also? Because a guy's too good. Are they going to put chairs on his side on the court? They're going to end up putting chairs over there. I think they, they should just leave a good thing alone. Just leave it alone. These kids are all hitting wedges. They're playing. Can you imagine? You remember when you played, you got a hundred, you got a par four that was 480. I mean, you had to hit a five wood in there or something big. These guys yeah. are hitting seven and eight irons, playing 500 yard holes. I mean, they're driving the ball 330, 340, you know. Um, but I think it's in a good spot. I, yeah, think golf, that keep, I think they keep messing with it. If they keep messing with it, they're going to mess it up. Yeah, they're going to mess it up. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, yeah. golf has never been more popular. More people are coming into the game now. I don't know why we want to change it, but you mentioned, I mean, how some of these guys play. I, I'm out there walking with Roy McIlroy, John Rom. I mean, where they drive the golf ball, Lee. I'm like, how do you ever play bad from here? You're 330 in the middle of every damn fairway. Tiger started it. I remember when they talked to Tiger about him hitting the ball so far, but he wasn't straight. And Tiger says, I don't care about being straight. He said, I want to hit it 350, and then I'll negotiate from there. And that's what Tiger told him. So everybody started killing it now. Gary Player told me years ago, he said, Lee, there's going to be a guy come along that's going to be 6'8", six, 6'7", six, six, he's going to hit it. We got a kid here that's going to Texas, Morrison, as you know. Mm -hmm. He's 6'9". Yeah. You know what? Yeah. I mean, he hits that ball so far that it goes out of sight. Uh, but – you know, they've got to leave this thing alone. I, I don't. I don't know why they're, they're talking about bringing the ball back. Yeah, it's not going to happen until thirty, probably, uh, and bring the ball back because it goes too far. It's all relevant. It doesn't make any difference how far it goes. You know, the guy still that hits it the farthest and it's got the fastest club head speed, regardless of what you make the ball, he's still going to be the longest hitter. Um, they should leave it alone. They, they should leave it alone. All these people, in my opinion, that are making these decisions, uh, I, I think I don't, I don't see anything wrong with them going into a boardroom and talking about what they're, they're going to do. But there can't be a cocktail party before they start this. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> now, that's good. The problem that's well is that said. they have a cocktail party, then they go in and have dinner and talk about this. So now that's a bad time. That's a what bad do you time. think we should do? Roll the ball? Yeah, make it go shorter. Golf's the only sport too where, the, where it seems like, or the only thing in life that I can think of that's trying to go backwards. Everything else is going forward, progressing, progressing. Golf's yeah. going backwards. I want to ask you something like staying on the modern game for a second because. You had a you had a homemade golf swing, self taught. You you turned yourself into one of the greatest ball strikers to ever play the game. What's your opinion right now on all the the teaching, the technology, the track mats, all this stuff, and a lot of swings? You see guys working on technique and position and stuff. Do you think there's just what's your opinion on all the technology and instruction and stuff yeah, going on right now? Made, that's what's made them better. That's what's made them better. Uh, simply because now uh, you, you you can have an instructor and he can tell you something and you may not believe him until you see it. You have to see it. And I, I've never had my swing filmed because I, I know it wasn't a good one. And, and, and 
I, I told him, I said, well, I don't want to eat before I see this. I, I said, whatever it is, <laughs> I don't want to have dinner before I see this way. But uh, not last week, for instance, Daniel and I were hitting dogs, and I have a bad habit of reaching out for the driver because I don't put the driver directly behind the ball, kind of I'm on the toe. And, I'm, you know, I'm always, I look like Fred Astaire. I'm always moving my feet. And then I, I whack at it. And Daniel back up be taking a, a, a film with his phone and he wanted to show me. And I'm going to tell you something. I had my elbow. This elbow was way out to the right. I mean, it was so far away from my body that I had no power, none whatsoever. And he said, that's, I said, you got to be joking. And then I saw a clip of Mr. Hogan. You remember what he said? He was, he was on the, Ed Sullivan show, I think he was once, and he says, all you have to do is take both elbows, he says, put them in your side, grab the club and swing it. That's what he said. That's how simple it is, you know. Uh, but um, yeah, I, you know, I, I kind of mess around a little bit too much. This is what happened. But I think it's great. I think the track man and, and all these teachers, I don't agree with taking these teachers with you to a tournament. Uh, I, I don't think that the, the I mean, I, I mean, I look at Augusta, there's, there's more instructors on the putting green uh, than, than they are participants. You understand what I'm saying? Um, I don't, I, I don't think they should be allowed to go to the major championship. If you're not ready to play in a major championship, you remember what Daryl Royal said about his football team? When he took his team out of town, he says, you got to dance with who brung you. That's just what it is. And uh, you, you can't uh, do that. I said that to Justin Thomas's dad. He, he and I were having some coffee at the Ryder Cup, and he had all these machines in his hands. And, and I, you know me, I'm a clown. I'm saying, what the hell is that? What is that stuff? And he said, well, it's a track man to check the thing. I said, listen, if you ain't ready, if, he would, if he's not ready when he got here, I said, that ain't, that's not going to help him. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good point. Now, you talk about that. Now, you see what Colin got a penalty. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. you see. You see how goofy all this stuff is? And see, these guys are in this room making these rules and stuff. And it's crazy. It's crazy. Now, Colin is playing. His caddy is the one that had a card to tell him where the errors were on the green. What the hell difference does it make? The yardages are on the sprinkler. You can use a, a range finder. You can use a book in the fairway. And you can't use one on the green? That doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, that None one was whatsoever. None. That one was confusing. Yeah, I didn't you understand. You can memorize that it, but you can't write it down. Yeah. Apparently, is the thing. So it's like you I gather mean, the what, information, what, but you, what, oh, you can't but you can it. memorize it. You can memorize it, but you can't write it down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's essentially Isn't the rule. That one. Now that had to be a genius that thought that one up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, uh, huh. and they yeah, changed so like much. Been at that meeting. Yeah, I mean, come on, man. Yep. Yeah, a lot of interesting things going on with it's the change different. in the game. Like, I mean, we went from hazard to penalty area. I mean, that that was a big topic. We had, we had yeah. to do that. God forbid you call it hazard out there. Yeah, but you brought up Augusta National, and I, and I know there's some things that happened, you know, off the golf course with Augusta National, but just your record there, because you won every other major twice. Augusta National, your best finish was 10th. Was mm -hmm. it just the case that you and the golf course didn't get along, didn't fit your eye, or what, no, what was the deal with Cliff the Roberts didn't get along. Yeah, well, I knew that. Yeah, <laughs> I'll play in a cotton field. Hey, listen, I'll play in a cotton field. Don't worry about it. That's, I tell people, I say, that's why I'm straight. I used to hit the balls down between the rows of the cotton, uh, you know. Uh, but no, no, no. Uh, we, we, he and I didn't see eye to eye on the ticket situation. Okay? And so, you know, I, um, I went to his office and we had a lot of discussions back and forth. <laughs> And uh, he was angry, and I was angry, and I'm short fused. I'm a very short fused person, and I just told them what they could do with it, and uh, I left. I didn't go back for three years. And Jack talked me into going back. Yeah, I led twice after 36 holes there, uh, but uh, tenth was the best I ever played on it. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was my fault. I should have never, I should have never lost my cool. Uh, but I'm, I'm, you know, I, uh, I do that. I don't do it as much now. My wife, Claudia, has kind of tamed me down a little bit. <laughs> and uh, I, my problem was I was never a listener. 
You understand? Uh, when you talk as much as I do, you're always talking. You don't listen to what people are saying to you. And I have a bad habit of that. And I've gotten better. Uh, I'm still not there. Um, I'm trying to get there before I turn 100. And maybe it'll be okay. Yeah. <laughs> you got plenty of time. One of my, one of my favorite yeah, I quotes. Got, I got a lot of time. I got 16 yeah, years yet. Yeah, dude. You're just figuring it out. One of my uh -huh. favorite quotes from you is when Tony Jacklin told you he didn't want to talk today. And you said, I don't need you to talk. I just need you to listen. Yeah, that was that was so funny. <laughs> it was so funny. We we're playing uh, Wentworth, uh, the match play championship, and it was the semifinals. And uh, it was seven thirty in the morning. It was it, it was a little cool because we played there in November, London, and so uh, he was already almost on the tee, and I came out of the locker room, and he stopped to talk to someone. And as I walked by him, he actually stopped me, and he says, "Listen." And uh, he said, uh, I just want to play golf today. He says, uh, I don't want to talk. And, and, and just as, because I'm pretty quick. And mm -hmm. I said, just as quick as he said that, I said, you don't have to talk, Tony. Just listen. I said, just listen. Don't have to talk. <laughs> you know that we had, if I'm not mistaken, in that match, we were playing the small ball. We played 36 holes, uh, semifinal. And we had three eagles and 26 birdies between the two of us. Wow. And I beat him one up. I made an eight footer on 18, Ooh. part five. Uh, and uh, I beat him one up on the last hole. Damn. Yeah. Hell of a match. Yeah. That is a hell of a match. And he I was, was always like, I'll you... tell you something about Tony Jacklin. He was a very handsome man and he could play. He could really play. And people always were talking about that when he lost that, the Open Championship at Muirfield, when Jack was going for the Triple Crown. For the third leg, and I chipped in, member on 17, and ended up winning the tournament by a shot uh, from Jack. And Jack was finished. Um, the, everybody, every, everybody talked about that Tony uh, quit simply because he, he was frustrated by losing that tournament, and that wasn't the case at all. That wasn't the case at all. And Tony told me that the reason he quit is because he didn't have a life. Uh, he was with IMG at the time, and that uh, he was running. He was just doing too much. He didn't have any time for himself. They were booking him here, 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 here. He was very popular. He won the U.S. Open in 70. He won the Open Championship. I mean, uh, he could really play. He could really play this guy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's kind of just golf in general. It's like you got to be a little bit selfish to do it. And there's just so much time it takes away from other things. But I think the era that you played in, Mr. Trevino, like there were so many characters of the game. Feels like there were more big personalities at the time. And I got one name I want to throw out to you here. And I just want you to tell me the first thing that comes to mind if I say the name John Jacobs. John Jacobs may have had, I don't know of anyone that had any more talent than he did. Um, he was the longest hitter of everybody back then. Um, nobody could come close to outdriving him. His brother, Tommy, wasn't half of the player that he was, even though Tommy went on to win a major and, and, and play extremely well for a lot of years. Passed away, I think, for three or four years ago. But John could hit it. He could absolutely hit it. Good-looking guy, big, 6'4". Um, I've lost track of him. I, I think he's still living. I'm not sure. Uh, nobody is. said anything to me about it. Do you want to know what he's doing? Actually, he owns a uh, <laughs> he owns a cupcake shop. Actually, I don't. I think he might be you on the run from right. the IRS. Remember, he owns a cupcake I shop. I remember he's owned that for a while. Hadn't in he? a in a state in the Western United States. Yeah, we don't want to give. <laughs> I don't want to give away his location. location. <laughs> I think he's on the lamb from a few people. But I think it was your quote that you said when you were asked about him. I think. It's something along these lines. You said, if John Jacobs didn't have every vice known to man, you would have never heard of Jack Nicholas. I'm telling you, he would, well, you'd have heard of Jack, but you'd have heard of you, but, but, but he would, he would, John would have been right next to him. Yeah. You'd have heard of him, but he, he, I mean, this guy had no, you didn't have a weakness. You know, golfers have weaknesses. You know that you played at a high level. You always have a weakness. It's either a, a bunker shot uh, or a, a to draw a driver uh, or, or to cut a wedge. Uh, there's weaknesses. No, Nobody has a weakness. Uh, the only guy that ever I've ever seen that didn't have a weakness, Jack couldn't play wedges. You know that. He was a bad wedge player. 
And I asked, I asked Jack one time, I said, let me ask you a question. I said, you know, he, 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 well, he up there, with, he, he's playing off of bent grass, you know, up in Ohio, you understand, where the divots, you, I mean, the birds, uh, when I play up in Connecticut, the birds follow me, those white birds, because I dig worms up, you know, because I hit down a hog so steep. And, and it's called, I'm used to playing on Bermuda grass, but, uh, but uh, you know, but uh, I asked Jack, I said, let me ask you a question. I said, why, the, the way you drive it, you're the greatest putter I've ever seen. I know Bobby Locke was good, but I, I didn't, I played with Bobby Locke. But Jack is the greatest still at the age of 60. He's going to be 64 January 20. Still can putt the same way. His, the method that he has is, is flawless. You know, nobody's ever copied it. And it's flawless the way he does it. And I asked him, I said, why are you such a bad wedge player? And he says, well, I never had to hit one. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you know, okay, because, you know, the court was like Donald Ross courses. What? The majority of the par fours were what? 365? 380? I mean, you never saw a 400-yard par four back in the old days. And Jack's hitting the ball 300 yards with the old stuff. Persimmon, 42-inch club, 11-inch degree on the driver. And he's hitting it 300 yards. He's the only one that can hit it 300 yards. If you read the last article... That was in the Kingdom magazine. He says, I know I had power. He says, but I never used it. He said, I very seldom ever used the whole power. And that's what he did. He lined up to the left, down the road. He, Jack would hit the, would, would aim down the left side of the rough and move the left shoulder as fast as he could. He had, Simpson had the fast left shoulder. Watch, watch Simpson. But Jack had the fastest left shoulder I've ever seen. What do you have when you have a fast left shoulder? You hold the angle longer. The hands don't have time to go this way. You understand? You hold the angle. And so he hit a fade. He hit a high fade every time to the green. He always aimed down the left side. Jack was a fader. Everybody thinks he drew the ball. He never did that. He faded everything. You know, just a small fade. Hit it higher than I did, but he but he moved it from from left to right. But he couldn't play a wedge. He couldn't play a wedge. Uh, it was it was very difficult for him. Finally, later in years, he went to uh, Phil Rogers in in San Diego, and Phil helped him a little bit, and he got better with it. When I beat him in the playoff at Marion, and you can look this up, I bogeyed one and went one down. He left it in the bunker on two. He left it in the bunker on three, and he. And he and he covered the ball up with his divot on ten, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, I mean he hit it fat, yeah. covered it right up. Um, I should have never beat him there. Uh, I should have never beat him there. It uh, we got a, a, a rain delay, and it rained for about an hour, and it softened up the golf course. And my low trajectory irons were stopping on the green now because Marion's got oval, small greens, and I always had trouble keeping the ball on the green there. And uh, that was the only reason I had a shot at him. I shot 68, and I think he shot 71. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, look, you, you came from not a whole lot growing up, obviously, but some of your best stories are your, the gambling games yes. you played in, which I'm fascinated with. I mean, that's basically how I learned how to play the game was under pressure, at least, was playing for some cash on the line. What yeah, was when it you like? didn't have any. <laughs> exactly. What was it like when – I mean, you you had guys out there backing you and booking on you, but what was it like going out there playing some of those gambling games? Oh, it was it was well, I loved it when a guy backed me. That's when I was dangerous because it wasn't my money, so I had no pressure, and and I could play a little bit. Pressure would come. You know, you played tennis in the East. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I had a I had a five to a six plus at tennis in the East. I never shot over sixty five, and uh, so. You know, when we got gambling games, I, I knew that, that the guy wasn't going to tell me what his handicap was, not his true handicap. I mean, if he was a seven, he would, uh, if he was a four or a three, he would say he was a seven and he thought he was taking advantage of me. But the thing about it is he'd ask me what my handicap was and I, I didn't know about plus and minus as far as handicap was concerned. And I'd say, I don't have one. Oh, he said, you're scratch. I said, I guess I don't, I don't have a handicap. He said, oh, okay. He said, well, you got to give me uh, uh, 
I'll take uh, four on the front and three on the back. I said, you got it. And I'd put 65 on it, 64. See, so that cheating me out of three strokes didn't help him any. <laughs> uh, it didn't help him any. And um, that's what I did. But, yeah, I I, I got – I was a fast gun. I got hired to, to play. Don't know what they bet. And I didn't care. I just, you know, when I when I went out and played, you know, the guy'd give me a hundred bucks. So, I mean, it was a lot of money back then. A lot, a lot of money. Yeah. Go back to one specific one because you have a lot of gambling stories that are well known, but this is the one that resonates with me. The game that was set up with Raymond Floyd when he came out to West Texas and then Titanic Thompson game as well the legend how did that get set up and and did you know who titanic thompson was at that time you had that match i did not know who ty was i i learned and i know he, i know his history now i know him pretty well and i i spent some time with him so i i, I knew uh after he watched me play he wanted me to travel with him and, and he wanted to stick me in the caddy barn in other words, and that's when he goes and, and picks a caddy. So I, I'll pick a caddy as my partner, and we'll play you two guys. And that's just what he did. The fat man did that one time, Marty Stanovich, when I was working at the driving range uh, back in the mid-60s. Uh, he came from Chicago and had a big game at Tennyson Park, and he heard about me. And the fat man came to the driving range, and, and he, he had a great personality. And he's leaning on the counter, and he's asking me all these questions and all this stuff. And he said, you know, he said, yeah, I hear you, you play out at tennis. And I said, I do. He said, yeah, I'm playing out there. I said, when are, you, when are you playing out there? And he said, well, I got a game out there. Who are you playing with? He said, oh, well, I'm playing with Dick Martin and and all, Arthur Carbon. And I knew all these guys. And, and, and all the big bookmakers, uh, you know, were all out there betting all the money. And so... He said, I found out that I found out that you play out there all the time and you're very good. I said, I want to take you as a partner. And he took me as a partner and we we cleaned house. And I came back to work. I never saw him again. So I'm in, in, in Florida later on in the years. Well, what happened is they were having some big games out at El Paso. And these farmers doing the cotton farming, they were out at Horizon Hill. They had a little golf course out there. And they were all playing and, and guys were coming in there. And they were playing this guy uh, was a golf professional. He had played the tour, played the senior tour a little bit. The guy was name was Fred Hawkins, uh, was the name of, of the guy that was playing these farmers and they were beating him up a little bit. And this one farmer, which is a, a big gambler, he played a lot of poker, he did all that stuff. And he, and he took the game up and he, he would play you. And he says to to this kid from Fort Worth. He says, do you know anyone that can play golf that no one knows? And he said, I know this Mexican kid in Dallas that works at a driving range, pretty good player. So he calls me on the phone, hires me for three days, $100 a day. I was making $100 working a week. So I jumped on a plane, he picks me up. I got a McGregor, I got a kangaroo bag, great kangaroo bag with McGregor on it with my name. And as soon as he, as soon as he picked me up at the airport in El Paso, he says, no, chico, no, chico. He <laughs> says, that, that bag's not going to make it. So he takes my bag, takes all my clubs out and sticks them in that. Remember the little cotton stick bag with a, with a, with a stick bag on it, the green one? He puts all the clubs in there. And we go out there and we go to the putting green. They're all there. There's one guy there named Jack Redmond. Remember, he owns Stylish Shoe Company. And he says, he goes over to, he goes over to the other guy and he says to him, he says, hey, who are you playing today? And Fred says, I don't know. He said, I'm playing that kid over there on the end. He says, what's his name? He said, I don't know. He said, he's from Dallas. His, his name is Lee Trevino. And, and so Redmond looked over and he says, Fred, he said, you better watch out. He said, I think I know that kid. And he says, hell no. He said, if I don't know him, he can't play. So we went out and I dusted him pretty bad. <laughs> so the next day we go to Campestre and I what is, and I beat him again. And then the third day we were supposed to play at Coronado and he didn't show up. So I went back home. So I came back out. Martin hired me again to come back and play the city champion and I beat him. So I stayed. So I got a job in the pro shop. I opened at five in the morning. I brought the carts out, cleaned up the locker room. I was just a handyman, that's what I was. But I got off at 11 where I could play the games. So one day, who do I see? Big Mickey, one of the big bookmakers from Dallas. 
and he's in the pro shop and he's laughing. Hey, baby, how you doing? Said, hey, Mickey, what the hell are you doing here? He said, I hear y'all are playing for a lot of money. I said, I'm not playing for a lot of money. I don't have anything. He said, well, I, I hear they'll bet on you if we bring somebody in here. And I said, well, Mr. Letnidge is right over there. You go talk to him. Now, Martin Letnidge had no clue who Raymond Floyd was. None. So Mickey goes over there and he says, listen, we want to bring a player in here, that uh, a professional. Uh, will you bet on your man if we bring him in to play? And Martin says, bring him on, Chico. He said, who, who, he says, we want to bring in Raymond Floyd. He says, I don't care who you bring. He says, bring him on. So I'm in the locker room one morning. Our driveway was Caliche. You could hear a car drive in. And I heard this car drive in. I looked out. It's a Cadillac. No Cadillac ever came in our parking lot. We had pickup trucks, motorcycles. We didn't have Cadillacs coming in there. So I see this guy get out of the passenger side. Tall, good took, had a pair of gorgeous blue pair of pants on, Munsingwear shirt, alligator shoes, Wilson bag in a cover. I go out in a cart, put it on the cart. It weighed 200 pounds, this thing. I take it in the locker room. I unload everything out of the bag, shoes, balls, everything falls out. He sits in a chair you know, about 15 feet away. And he says, uh, can I get a Diet Coke? Sure. I went in a bar, got him a Diet Coke. He said, is there anyone here who plays gin? I said, not, nah, not this early. It was about 10 o'clock. So one of the guys that came with him had gone to the pro shop to get a cart so they could see the golf course. And he comes running back. But before he came running back, Raymond says to me, whom am I playing today? And I said, you're playing me, Mr. Floyd. He said, who are you? I said, I'm nobody. I said, I just do the handiwork around here and I play. Okay. So the guy says, come on, let's go look at the course. He said, I got a, I got a cart. He said, I'm not going out to look at no golf course. That's what thing Raymond said. He said, I'm playing the locker room attendant. He said, I'm not going out there. So we teed off at one o'clock and I shot I can't remember exactly, but I shot 64 or 65 at him. And I beat him one or two shots. And when we finished, he wanted to play another nine, emergency nine. And I told him I couldn't play an emergency nine because I had to put the carts up. <laughs> and he says, I'm playing the cart man too. So he comes back the next day and I shoot the same thing. And I beat him again. And then everybody dropped out. They, they pulled up. Raymond didn't. Uh, I got to tell you about him. Raymond is a competitor. Uh, he didn't pull up. He tripled up. He went triple bet. And when we came to 18, we both had eagle putts. Mine was 15 feet. And his was 20. He made his and I missed mine. Mm. And he picked up his ball and he says, adios. <laughs> <laughs> I've had enough of you. I ain't coming back. He said, that's it. Yeah, he's. He and I tell that story. And you know what he does? He says, he tells the story. I've had people come to me and they said, you know, I've heard that story from you and I've heard it from him. And he said, it's word for word. I said, I'll never tell you a lie, my friend, because I can tell you this 10 years from now. That's right. That's exactly what happened. Yeah. That's, and awesome. then that's one of the best. That was, the, that was in um, probably 60. Six, maybe somewhere in there. I think he had just won the Azalea Open or something. I think he had just won a tournament, his first tournament, when he came there. That's yeah. such a good story. I could talk gambling stories with you all day, but I, I want to get your opinion on what's going on right now with golf, with Liv and everything, all this money getting thrown around, guys yeah. potentially jumping tours and all this. How does yeah. how does that make you feel? Well, you know, it, it's pretty pretty hard to, to, to have an opinion on that when when I don't really know what I would do. I, I can't really – it's hard to answer that. I mean, how do you turn down something like that? Yeah. I mean, if it's guaranteed, if it's in your bank, I mean, that, that's a hard thing to do. You 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 have to understand that you're self-employed. Uh, there's an organization here that actually is running these golf tournaments. They don't own you. They don't own you. They think they own you, but they don't. 
They don't own you. You just happen to be have a membership at a club, and you have to qualify to go over there and play in that club. And I, I remember talking to Monahan uh, when when he came to the father son when he first got in, and he says to me, he said, uh, "How are we doing?" I said, "There's two things I don't like." And, and one was that if you miss the cut, you don't make a quarter. And that's not good. You got a family, you got rent, and you got expenses. Now, if they paid all your expenses and you missed the cut, then that's okay. And I said, the other thing I don't like, I said, is the shuffle. I don't think, I think if a, if a young man gets a card, how do you expect him to keep that card if he can't play all the tournament? You know, you shuffle him. If this guy doesn't play well the first quarter or two months, then he gets he gets thrown out here and hopes he gets in down the line. I said, that's the two things I don't like. Don't like him. And I like it that he's straightened that out. Now the players are getting a fee if they get a card. I don't know if it's a loan. I don't know how it works. I don't care. It doesn't make any difference. But at least if they miss the cut, they got, you know, mama's got some money to buy groceries. <laughs> and I like that. I like that a lot. As far as Liv and what they've done, they've got a lot of money. They have a ton of money. Uh, I don't know how much money we've spent on lawyer fees, but they can they they can absolutely they can absolutely keep us in court until we don't have a golf club, we don't have we don't have a golf ball, mm -hmm. and and and, and that's the whole problem. It happened in 1969. Nobody's even talked about it. I was in on that deal. The tour players wanted to go on their own. This is, the, but this whole thing, but live is a different thing. This still was in the United States. The other, the other thing that happened, we were still going to be here. But in 1969, the players, in other words, they had a revolt. They wanted to go on their own. They wanted to run their own tournaments, start their own, you know, their own deal. And the PGA owned it. And I think the PGA ended up with the Ryder Cup. That's how they, they ended up with the Ryder Cup, and they let the players go. Now, the threat was exactly the way the threat was here. The PGA of America told us back then that if we left the PGA and went with this new organization, which is the players' organization, we would lose our PGA card. I couldn't afford to do that because I had no options. The PJ was my life. It still is. I worked very hard to get that card. I worked four years under a class A professional, and we went to the business school in Chicago for two weeks. And I got my PJ card, and that was going to be my life income was PJ. I could pick up range balls. I could give lessons. I, there's something that I could do. I was the only one that didn't jump ship. I stayed with the PJ. And I was and I was already a major winner. I stayed with the PGA. I didn't go with the players. And I believe Joe Dye, if I'm not mistaken, was the commissioner at the time. Um, Max Elbin might have been the PGA president, if I'm not mistaken. And they settled it. Everything was fine. They got the Ryder Cup. PGA went on, and it was very successful. This thing now. It's very difficult. It's a very difficult thing. And, you know, everybody's talking about it. I don't know where it's going, but I will say this. That if it is true that they have $600 billion in that kitty, I don't know how we're going to compete. I do not know how we're going to compete. Really, I don't. I don't think that... I think when you when you look at it, they're starting to get better and better players. If they get points, if they if they they're negotiating now, if I'm not mistaken, to get points. In other words, like to play in these tournaments. If that happens, if they go to four rounds at Lille and take that that tour to sixty, and still pay these players. I, I can't tell you how many players we're going to lose and good ones. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah the money ain't, 
the money's not going anywhere. I mean, that's endless. As long as they want to keep a golf tour, whether it's prov- profitable they or not, do, they, they can, can do it. They can absolutely drown you. I mean, yeah. it's, I mean, I, I, I mean, it's just, I mean, Jimmy Dunn says you got to follow the money, and 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 he's right. I mean, what can we do? I mean, we only we're nonprofit. We can we only have so much, and when we run out of money, we, there's no way we can find it. Yeah, and I don't know how you feel. And, and you know what what I'm afraid of? If they get a network, then they might not need the tour. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, and I think that just stinks for the fan, Lee, because for me personally, it sounds like you kind of feel the same way. I don't blame one of these guys, one lick for going over there, taking that money. There's no guarantee playing golf. You could be done the next year, and all of a sudden you're off tour, and things can change, right? So every guy goes over there, I shake their hand, congratulations, that's awesome. All I want to see as a fan is I I want there's so many good players, so much talent right now. I just want to see them play against one another as much as possible. And right now it's really you only get the majors and you're not even getting all those because some of the guys, you know, they don't qualify for them. But it's like it's just diluted the amount of events per year where we get genuinely the best in the world from all over the world to compete against one another. I just want to see that. That's what that's what we're going to if they go to this point thing then you're going to get, I think that you'll end up in the majors getting the best in the world. They'll play against each other simply because uh, even if they're on live, they're going to be able to play the major championship. But this country loves this game. I love it. I eat it, as you well know. I oh, sleep yeah. it. I mean, I mean, here, I'm 84 years old. As soon as I cut with you, I'm going to Preston Trails and start hitting golf balls. Who hits golf balls at the age of 64? <laughs> Nobody, but I do it, <clears throat> and I hit them every day. Not very good, and uh, I'm, I'm still thinking that I can find it. You understand what I'm saying? I didn't realize that this game was that hard. You know, I didn't realize it. I will tell you this, and it's the gospel truth. I played a pro-am a month, five weeks ago, at the National, and it was for scholarship, PGA scholarships. For the kids. And I had a birdie, nine pars, and I shot 82. <laughs> and I'm in the car, <laughs> and I'm saying to Daniel, and I said, you know what I shot today? I said, I can't believe it. I said, I can't. And I'm on, I was on the third tees. Now, my mom up there. I'm way up there. And I said, I shot 90. I mean, I shot 82. And Daniel says, what are you complaining about? He said, you broke your age. <laughs> that's so good. <laughs> Daniel, the little that's why, savage. That's why, hey, that's why Daniel and I went into business. I got to have something to do. Yeah. Yeah, congrats, by the way, on the Supermax golf line. That's uh, that's awesome. We got to go check that out. Um, we only got a few minutes left. I want to get to the E9 real quick. Lee, these are nine fun questions we like to ask. Let's just yeah. skip the first one. And go. Yeah, that's the first fine. one. Uh, don't yeah, want anybody uh, how about Trevino. this one to start off? What's the most you've ever beaten your age by? Most amount of shots. Oh, I, I, oh my, my. Um, Who? Probably um, eight shots. Nice. That's good. What yeah. was that? Were you in your like mid seventies in there, and you shot mm-hmm. in the sixties? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's kind of what I was. Yeah, I was about seventy-seven, by a lot. maybe. Yeah, that's tough to do. Beating about eight. There ain't many that can do that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Next question. Do you think over the course of time you sent more dozen roses to your wife or Barbara Nicholas when you first joined the Champions Tour? <laughs> you heard about that? Love it. <laughs> I got to explain that to people. Well, if it was it was I, to Barbara Nicholas, I, I sent her thirty dozen for the year. <laughs> she loves you. Yeah, she loves me. Yeah. God bless you. You're uh, trying to keep Jack at home. You didn't want him out there on the Champions Tour playing That's against you. That's what I told her. When yeah. I turned 90, and I I won four out of the first five tournaments in Senior Tour when I turned when I turned 50 in 1990. And I specifically called Barbara Nicholas, and I said, listen, you keep Jack at home. I said, for every tournament that I play in, that he stays home, I'm going to send you a dozen roses. And I played 38 <laughs> tournaments in, 19, in 1990, and I sent her 30, 30 dozen roses. He only played eight. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's a good strategy. Hell like of a that. strategy. Um, where should I start here? All right, I'll give you this one because we brought it up. 
as he famously said to Tony Jacklin, you don't have to talk today. You just got to listen, right? Yeah. Give me yeah. one guy. Was there any one guy in particular that you talked to or when you're in your heyday more than usual? Because, you know, they really didn't like it. Tony Jacklin aside. Not really. Uh, I tried to talk to Jack when we played. But Jack walked too fast. And I couldn't keep up with it. His, his, his stride wasn't long, but it was quick. And, um, man, after about after about 100 yards, I mean, I had to slow down. I'd slow down. I never, ne I never finished the story when I was talking to him because I, I couldn't keep up with him. Yeah, I, he was he, <laughs> he was the one I like. I like to talk to. I talked to Mr. Hogan one time. I played with him at Champions. And, uh, and they asked him, and he says, uh, yeah, he says, we, we, we talked a little bit because I was scared to say anything because, you know, he, he was uh, – he was very meticulous about what about his golf, you know, the way he played. Yeah. Yeah, you two opposite ends of the spectrum there in terms of how you operate on the course. All right. Next one. What paid more? Your rookie year on the PGA tour or your royalties from Happy Gilmore? Oh, I, I think I, I'm still getting royalties from Happy Hell Gilmore. Yeah. yeah, I get mailbox money. I am still. I still get it. Yeah. But uh yeah, probably Happy Gilmore. I, I got a pretty lump sum in the beginning, too. <laughs> wonderful that was some wonderful acting i loved it how many takes how many takes yeah, for that line that's great see I, I told him i said that covers all the languages yep that's right yeah yeah that's right that's great was that one take did it only take you one take to get that one yeah we, we 15 minutes i did four nice well yeah. done in the parking lot you know where it was it was in the parking lot at the pga national in uh in this and um uh in west palm beach yeah oh they call me up they call me up and uh, my manager called me up and says, listen, um, uh, this guy's doing a, a, a golf story. He's a hockey player and he's doing a golf show uh, movie. And he wants you to do four cameos for him. I said, sure. I said, well, where do you want to go? And he said, well, they can go anywhere. So I called him up and they said, well, we need a parking lot because we want to put a clown's head, you know, in there like a miniature golf course. That's why they only shot from the waist up. And I said, how about you know what a good parking lot i said pga i said go to the go to the pga headquarters i said they got a big parking lot there and that's where we went yeah that's now those great. royalties are going to keep coming that thing ain't oh, going yeah. anywhere oh, for yeah. a long time yeah. uh, my, my next one uh going back to your gambling stuff give me was there any gambler out in west texas or somebody that's like a relatively unknown the best gambler you ever played against back in your hustling days that was toughest to beat no, not really. Uh, I, I, I had, a, you know, the, the kid that I, that could play better than I couldn't put a lick now, and he was young and he was the assistant pro at Cedar Crest. And his dad was the second Bobby Jones. And, and it was a kid by the name of Bobby Moreland. His father was named Gus Morgan. And I, you need to look this guy up one time. I have a book of him. The reason I know him so well, because I was close to the family. But uh, he, he just about played everything. Walker Cup. I mean, he did it all. He did it in the 30s, late 30s, uh, early 30s. And Bobby Moreland w was the toughest one I ever had to beat. Uh, but I, I would I would clip him because he putted so bad. Cause he, he didn't play one round of golf that he didn't three putt at least four greens. Yeah. And it was his home course. Mm. Yeah. You know, when you when you start three putting greens in your home course, you got a problem with the stroke with the stroke. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that is never good. All right. Obviously, it's not going to happen for a very long time. But let's just say you got one last round of golf in you. Where are you playing it? Cypress. Yeah. At Pebble Beach. I think Cypress Point is the is 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 just the most magnificent place I've ever been. Pine Valley, I love, but I can't walk Pine Valley because it was, uh, you know, uh, it, it it was a, a lot of sand. Uh, the way you walk on it, uh, it's it's very difficult, very difficult golf course to to walk. But but uh, Cypress Point, in my opinion, for the exception of the 18th hole, mm -hmm. the 18th hole is very weak. You know, they need to redo something with that thing. I tried to get them to lower it. I told him, I said, you need to put the tee up another four feet and you need to lower the green about 15 feet. And I said, then you have something. And uh, but uh, I, I think the, the people say, what's your favorite hole at Cyprus? I said, the part three. And they said, 16. I said, hell no, 16. I said, 16 is not a great part three. 
I said, you got a T and you have to hit over the ocean to a green. That, that's not any, there's no architecture there. I said, now, 16, you know, I mean. Uh, 15, uh, 15. 15. Yeah. Ah. Yes. Now, is that, I'm with you. That is the greatest part three I've ever played. And what do you hit to it? Eight iron, maybe? Yeah, yeah. maybe. Maybe, yeah. most. Yeah. Beautiful hole. I'm with you uh, on that. What a hole. And the one, and the one before it is not too bad. You're under 14 up there on the hill. That's yeah, a tough part for I, I, I just love Cypress. I just absolutely adore it. Yeah. Yep. Tough. Good answer. Tough one to beat. All right. This might be a tough one to answer as well, but I always find it interesting to ask because it's not always what you think. But if you had to go back in your career, the one shot you're most proud of, does anything come to mind? Well, I made a million dollars in Traverse City with a hole in one. <laughs> that was a good one. Three. But I'll tell you what, I won the Dunhill Cup at, 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 at the Woburn Abbey and I beat Seve. We were playing 36 holes on the last round and um, and I was about five or six shots behind him and I caught him and I was playing in front of him and I was so far back that my wife had checked out, taken the luggage, gone to the airport in London to check everything in because we'd had a rain delay. And I ended up winning the tournament and she wasn't there. And I hit three wood, about 240, two inches from the hole. Mm. And um, I actually pushed it a little bit and it bounced left. It was going in a bunker and the ball bounced left and ran up on the green about two inches from the hole. I made eagle on the last hole and I beat Seve by a shot. That's sweet. <laughs> That's awesome. That's that sweet. was I was pretty proud of that one. Yeah. All right, nice one. Last one for me, and I don't know if you'll remember this, but you and I were out at Merido one day, and we we're on the putting green. Yeah. And this kid came sprinting by, and two cops were chasing after him. And everyone knows you and loves you. And when you saw these cops running, you immediately turned around to the cart and put your hands up on the cart and like, don't shoot, don't shoot. Do you remember <laughs> what the cop said to you? No, I don't remember. He, he said, too much paperwork, Mr. Trevino. We got to go get this guy. <laughs> <laughs> I used to kid. Every time I see a cop, I'd, I'd get up against, I'd put my hands up on the hood. <laughs> <laughs> so good. <laughs> Just get it out of the yeah, way. I, don't, I wouldn't do that now because they're, they're – they're a little ir irritated, you know. They're they're treated like third class citizens yeah. now, which is which is, angers me a lot. I'm with you on that, but I will never forget that day because you and I are just we're on the putting green, just putting, and this kid comes sprinting by. Apparently, he shoplifted, and the cops were chasing after <laughs> it was him. Just some random kid. Yeah, it wasn't like a dude on the golf no. course. Oh, yeah, that was like that was like Peter Jacobson tackling the guy nude at the at the, yeah. at the open. You remember that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was a pretty good tackle. That too. was good form. That was good yeah, form. good form. Yeah, yeah, big dude. Well, Mr. Trevino, you're the yeah. greatest in the world, man. You're the best storyteller. There's nobody out there like you now. We thank you so much for your time. Appreciate you coming God, on. God bless you for your time, man. Thank you very much. All right. That was the one, the only Lee Trevino on Subpar. So, ladies, that man, 84 years young and still can just go like he's 25. Sharp as a tack, dude. He's got one, some of the best quotes that are still quoted in the game of golf. Dude, the, I can't wait to wake up in the morning and hear what I have to say line is one of the best in the world uh we use that all the time but man how good getting to sit down with him talk a little shop the gambling stories i would love to get down there in person talk with him and just literally do multiple hours on the gambling stories because the ray floyd the titanic thompson story those stuff those things are incredible man and it's just a perfect example cult that like these dudes like they don't exist really anymore in today's game you know they don't make them like lee trevino anymore nor will they ever will as i said i was lucky enough to spend quite a bit of time with him back in Dallas, played with him a few times, practiced with him. And this was back when he was 75, 77 years old. And like, he still had it. Like his, the sound coming off the club face was just incredible. Him explaining how he hits certain shots around the greens at 75 years old. He's, at, he's getting the ball to spin out of a plug lie in the bunker. I'm just like, my God, you're not a human. It's so cool. And just his, his story of growing up, I mean, with nothing, I mean, nothing going from nothing to a six time major champion being one of the greatest ever, and in my opinion, by far the best personality we have ever seen in the game of golf. I just love it, man. That was a true bucket list for us here at Subpar to get him on. Without question, man. And like I like talking to him about the technology and the teaching and stuff today. 
you know, in today's game, because if you ask me, like he even says, like my golf swing wasn't the prettiest. Right. And I was like, I, I would completely disagree. I think he has one of my favorite golf swings ever in the history of uh, golf. And you hear stop the way it at impact. On. Yeah, I do. It's exactly. He had yeah. it exactly where he was looking. One of the greatest shot makers in the history of the game. And you talk and you hear the way he speaks about Jack Nicklaus, like he's the goat. He's the greatest ever. Even when they talk to Jack Nicklaus, he's like, there's two guys that hit the ball that was like special. And he's like Ben Hogan. And Lee Trevino. Mm -hmm. Like, there's no bad golf swings that that create, you know, that get guys like Jack talking about you like that, man. So just so fun to speak to Mr. Trevino. That was a that's a, a true pleasure. Just one of the one of the OGs, man. Yeah, and his record against Nicholas, I mean, second to none. Yeah. Pretty cool. How he was he, great against him. Yeah, he battled. Um, by the way, I got some special t-shirt shirts from you for Super Max. Love that. Yeah, love that. Send some hats Bring and some t-shirts. I know you're not a hat guy, but the hats are pretty cool. They're the old Lee Trevino style too, with the the logo on it. No, anything. I'll, if I'm going to wear a hat, it'll be for it'll be for Lee. Happy to do it. All right, let's get to some gambling here. It's football season. It's all we got to bet on. Q School is this week, by the way. Best of luck to everybody out at Q School yes. down there in, in Jacksonville this week. My Cowboys dominated the Philadelphia Eagles. Just made me so happy, Sleeves. We had a little controversy in the Chiefs game. Kadarius Tony, yes, what dude. are you doing, sir? Patrick out. was not happy. You don't see Mahomes get too pissed off like that too often. The man was heated after that. He By did. the way, like, I don't know. He was offsides, of course. And I guess he was lined up multiple times. I know they're calling it more this year, but just like a little a little nudge from the ref. Like, we're talking about inches here. Come on, man. Yeah, but it was a penalty. If yeah. it's my team, that if I'm the Chiefs fan, I'd be pissed off as hell. If I'm the other team, I'd be like, look, dude, you're offsides. What do you want us he to do? He was pretty it? far offsides. And all the ref, it I mean, was. And every time we see it, football guys, I mean, the, the receiver points, checks and says, am I good? And he gave it a point, but he didn't pay attention to what the ref said. Or the ref probably would have told him to back up a little bit. He's having a rough go this year in KC. Not great. Not a great year for Mr. Tony. No, it is not. He got off to a rough start. And by the way, it's going to lead to one of Taylor Swift's newest songs, by the way, from what I'm being told. Because obviously, she was in the building once again. And because of this mess up, obviously, the girlfriend... Of Travis Kelsey. We got a new lyric for you. You ready? Feed me. From the newest Taylor Swift song. You said you love me, but that was a bunch of baloney because you let me down. You're such a Kadarius Tony. <laughs> Is that the new? <laughs> that's platinum. Triple platinum. <laughs> yes. Stamp it. Yeah, that's what's going to happen. You're going to fuck around and get Taylor Swift writing lyrics about you. You keep messing up games like this. That's, uh, and that's a problem. You do not want that smoke with the, with the Swifties. And by the way, one of the greatest plays ever too i mean for kelsey I know, just to look so up and see that it. i know it's just never if gonna, it, hadn't, it, it hadn't worked out like that I'd be like oh, who cares but i mean damn all right well Rough let's one. get an nfl pick in there see if we can make some money this week the only reason i'm taking this game is because they're telling me they got a chance right before i came here monday night countdown was on and i saw the chicago bears have a one percent chance of making the playoffs and that's all i need they're so going you're up saying the, there's a chance they're going up against the cleveland browns this week they're coming off a big win against the Detroit Lions. The Cleveland Browns, I don't know who's going to play quarterback because Joe Flacco just got had to go back to the practice squad even though they said he was going to be the starter the rest of the year. So I don't even know who's going to play quarterback for the Browns. And the Bears are catching three points. Give me the Bears and that 1%. That 1%, time to make history for Chicago. I thought they went from tanking to now they got a 1% chance to make the playoffs. They're kind of in that uh, middle ground right now. But my pick, Colt, I'm going with the team we just talked about because I think they are pissed. They are out for blood. Give me the Kansas City Chiefs, oh minus my. nine and a hook at New England, who New England, Sucks. I'm not sure if the Patriots are, if they're officially tanking, if they're on record saying we're tanking, we stink, but they sure as hell play like they're tanking. Uh, this is a bad spot to catch the Chiefs pissed off and actually needing needing to win some games for the first time in a while in terms of their uh, their playoff spot. So give me Kansas City in a boat race at New England. I don't know. They just took down the Steelers with Zappy, a quarterback. I Look know. Out. I I don't know what they're doing either, dude. They either tank or don't tank. Just don't be in the middle. You know, get a dude or don't. All right. Well, here we go. But once again, thanks to Lee Trevino for sitting down with us and being so gracious with his time. That was one of my favorite interviews we've ever done. A lot of fun. We got another special one for you, but you have to stay tuned to next week's Subpar.